وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد We were talking about things that help and aid a person to become precise and accurate in seeking knowledge things that will help you We previously spoke about uh, three points The first one is to give importance to the book that you're studying at tarkizu ala al-matn al-madrus if you're studying a matn a book that you give importance to that book that you're studying and that you don't leave that book you don't move to another book and that you try to memorize the masail that are in that book you try to memorize the ahkam and you also try to memorize the uh, adilla and evidences that are in it but to focus greatly on what but to focus greatly on the method that you're, you're learning. I said that student of knowledge should try to avoid to buying shuruhat at its early stages. Don't buy books, explanations. Buy just the method, the text. What do you buy? Buy the text. And focus on understanding that text. We spoke about that, that was the first point. The second we spoke about that will help you in becoming a person who's solid and strong in knowledge is by al-hirsu al al-hifd giving a lot of importance to memorization having a daily portion of things that you're going to memorize okay that was the second thing that we spoke about and we spoke about uh, what is it that we need to memorize i said three things is what a person needs to memorize should memorize has to memorize is that the person should give time to memorizing masai we spoke about that what that means and the second thing is that you need to memorize things the hukum and the rulings that the scholars gave this mis'ala wajib who said it you learn it mustahab who said it you learn it and you also try to learn at that point when they say it's wajib why was the reason they said it's wajib and the third thing that i said was the adilla the evidences that they brought forward so you try to memorize Books like Bulugh al and books like that, the person gives ahmiyah and importance to it. So it helps and it aids a person to be dhabit, to be precise and accurate in knowledge. Then inshallah ta'ala, I spoke about the third point which is, uh, we first, within, the second one, sorry, within the second one, we talked about the two types of memorization. We talked about hifd which is bin nas, when the person sits down and they memorize something word for word. They memorize it what? Word for word, they sit down, they go home, they read, 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 read until they memorize it, let nothing drops. Like we memorize the Quran and the way that we memorize a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. There's a second type of hifd memorization, which I call, which we called uh, al-hifd bil istidhar. Whereas that the person didn't intend to memorize, but because of this person's excessive reading and the iqila and they're going over books, and this hadith keeps coming about, keeps coming about. You've been seeing it so much. You've been seeing the statement of the scholar so much. You've been seeing this uh, uh, ruling so much. And now it's just kind of stuck with you. But you may not have it word for word. You have, have 80% of the wording. Or you have 70% of the wording with you. But some parts of it is not with you. This is now a type of hifd as well. That occurs. We spoke about that. Then we moved on to the third thing that will help you and aid you if you want to be precise in seeking knowledge is that you don't move from one stage to another stage. You don't move from one method to another method. Nowadays, students of knowledge, they get excited, they see a book. As they're reading a method with a sheikh, they're reading a method with a sheikh. So they see a new method come out, or they see another scholar praise a method. So what do they do? They leave the one that they're studying, they go to that method. They go to that text, that book. So they keep moving from book to book. And each book, if you ask them, they've done maybe half of the book. So they've done half in this book, half in this book, half of this, half of this, and they have no book complete. So a person shouldn't do that. And also, if you haven't 
grounded yourself in the book before, don't move on to the second book unless you fully understand the first book. That's very important. Now, inshallah ta'ala, today we're going to go into the fourth thing that will help you. Fourth thing that will allow you to be precise, it will allow you to be accurate and strong in attaining and gaining knowledge. And that is, ikhtiyaru kitabin jami'in. You choose a comprehensive book. Fi kulli fannin in every subject. Yakunu marji'an fil babi. This is very powerful, this one's very important. Every single subject and every single topic, what you have is a kitab which is jami'. What does it mean, kitab which is jami'? A very comprehensive book. This book is for you as an individual, a book that you go back to in all of that issue of that field. You go back to that kitab. For instance, Tawheed. Tawheed. I won't always go back to Nawaqid al Islam or Qawaid al Arba or Kashf al Shubuhat. There's no need. I have one book personally. If I want to go to a mas'ala related to Tawheed, everything I've ever studied on Tawheed and everything I've ever learned on Tawheed, I've personally placed in one book. On the sides, on the notes, on the. I've summarized it, I've rewritten Fahras for it. I've, this is the book I've put all, I exerted all my efforts in. So, oh, whenever I'm asked, can you explain a, a Tawheed book? I'm not going to bring uh, a, a, a random book. I've got this book. All the ma'lumat, all of the information is in there for me. Which is Fatul Majid. Which is a Sharah of Kitab Tawheed. It's a marja' for me. It's a what? It's a reference point. This is the book I go back to. This is where every single thing I would need as a student of knowledge should be in for me. A student should have that. And this happens, brothers, once you've already done the program. You started with Nawaqid al-Islam. Then you did Qawaid al-Arba'a. Then you did Thalathat al-Usul. Then you did Kashf al-Shubuhat. Then you did uh, Kitab al-Tawheed. Once you've done Kitab al-Tawheed, and you've done the Sharah of Abd rahman ibn Hassan, uh, ibn uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, who's the grandson of Muhammad Abdul Wahab, he has a Sharah, Kitab called Fatul Majid. You do his Sharah of Kitab al-Tawheed, after the, the one of Sheikh ibn Uthaymin, Sheikh ibn Uthaymin simplifies it, it's called Qawl al-Mufid. That kitab of Abd al-Rahman ibn Hassan, which is called Fatul al-Majid, is the one you place the Sharah of Nawaqid al-Islam, the Sharah of Qawaid al-Arba, Kashf al-Shubuhad, Al-Kitab al-Tawheed, everything you wrote is on for you, watch kitab, Ya Fatul al-Majid, it's on there for you. This book is now a marja', it's a reference point for you. In Tawheed, anything related to Tawheed, related to what? A Tawheed is Fatul Majid for you. It's a very comprehensive book. Some scholars, some other tulab al ilm, they made the Kitab Al Raddu Al Al Bakri by Shaykh Al Islam Taymiya that Marjah in Tawheed. Okay? Some people they chose Al Raddu Al Al Bakri, about the book known as Kitab Al Istighatha by Shaykh Al Islam Taymiya, they made that book. Their marja in Tawheed. It's your choice, whichever one you like. I find Fatul Majid very comprehensive. Are we all together? Then the person does that for the other subjects, like Aqeedah. And you know there's a difference between Tawheed and Aqeedah, right? So the person, when it comes to Tawheed, he has Fatul Majid. And when, when it comes to Aqeedah, he's got the Sharah of Ibn Abi Al Hanafi, which is the Sharah of Aqeedah Tahawiyah. The Sharah of Aqeedah Tahawiyah by Ibn Abi Al Al Hanafi. Is going to be your reference point for Aqeedah now. Okay, in Aqeedah, that's your reference point. That is what? That is your reference point. You go back to that, you look at that, you ponder and you, you get everything from there. Some other Tullab al Ilm, I personally like that Kitab, the Sharah of Ibn Abi Al Iz al Hanafi. And if somebody really masters the Sharh of Ibn Aziz al-Hanafi on Aqeedah al-Tahawiyah, understands word for word what the Sharh is saying, all the explainer, not the Shmatan, not the text, because you've done the text before, by that time. The Sharh of Ibn Aziz al-Hanafi, his Sharh. If you understand it properly and you know what, he, what he's saying, any Aqeedah book that's given to you, whatever it may be, if you've never in your life seen it, you can explain it based on the Sharh of Ibn Aziz al-Hanafi. You take it from there. Are we all together? You take that Sharh, and you apply on it. Whether it be Sharh of Al-Imam Al-Muzani uh, Kitab, uh, Sharh Sunnah, 
whether it be Kitab Sarih al-Sunnah by Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, whether it even be the Kitab Qawam al-Sunnah's Kitab uh, Abu Qasim al-Taymi rahimahullah al-Hujjah fi bayan al-Hajjah, whichever Kitab it may be in Aqeedah, you can take it from the Sharh of Ibn Abdul Aziz al-Hanafi. And you can explain it. You don't have to say, oh, I've never seen this book before. Oh, I can't teach it. I don't know it. You don't need to do every single book. You have one kitab, which is a what? It's a marja, it's a reference point for you. That's, uh, some scholars, some tulab al-ilm, they prefer not to do uh, Ibn Abi al Hanafi's sharh aqid tahawiyan. So what do they use? They use the muhtasar, al-sawa'iq al-mursala. The muhtasar, al-sawa'iq al-mursala by who? By Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziyah they make that aqidah book their reference. Something like that. So they use it, they go back to that, they reference it. Also, you do the same with fiqh. In fiqh, you have a kitab where it's going to be a reference point for you. If the person is a hanbali, I can't speak for shafi'i, uh, malikiyah, la wala hanafiyah. Like in the hanabila, their reference point would be the rawdul murbi' by Buhuti, rahimahullah. That is a reference point for a person who is studying the Hanbali Madhab. They'll get the Rawdul Murbi' by Buhuti, and that's the book that they will use as a reference point. Or some may even add on to that the Hashia of Ibn al-Qasim on the Rawdul Murbi'. Like in Inda Shafi'iya is what? What's the reference point? What's the kitab that? Some say it is Minhaj by Nawawi. Some say it's Minhaj, and some say it's the Irshad. Those are the two books. Like in the Minhaj of Nawawi is enough. If you take the Minhaj of Imam al-Nawawi in Madhab al-Shafi'i, and you make that your reference point, you make that your marja' with the shuruh and explanations you placed on it, it's a good book to go back to. Whichever kitab within the Shafi'i Madhab that you want to teach, whether it be Udda al-Salik or Udda al-Nasik, whether it be a Matnab al-Shuja'a, whether it be any kitab, the Zubad, Ibn Raslan, Yaqut uh, al-Nafis, whichever kitab it may be, the Minhaj will suffice you. It will give you a good marja. Now you come to Usul al-Fiqh. You come back, you come to, you come to the Usul al-Fiqh. And you want to make a reference point in the Usul al-Fiqh. Usul al-Fiqh, the kitab that I think you could make as a reference point, is the Rawdatul Nadir wa Jannatul Munadir. The Rawdatul Nadir wa Jannatul Munadir is written by Ibn Qudama al Maqdisi. Ibn Qudama wrote this book. And the Kitab Rawdatul Nadir wa Jannatul Munadir is actually a summary of the Mustasfa written by Abu Hamid al Ghazali. Abu Hamid al Ghazali is from the Mutakallimeen, he's from the Ash'ariya. And he spoke about some matters pertaining to Ilm al Kalam. Whereas Al Imam Ibn Qudama rahimahullah came after him and he took out the Kalami discussions that he brought into Ilm Usul al Fiqh, which are not part of it. So the Kitab Rawdatul Nadir wa Jannatul Munadir, if you make that book your marji', if you make that your reference point, you bring all of the information onto that book, that's good in Usul al Fiqh. Some scholars they choose the Mukhtasar al Tahrir, Ibn al Najjar. The Mukhtasar. Mukhtasar al-Tahrir by Ibn al-Najjar. They bring all of that onto that book. And so they say, this is the reference point for us. There's differences that people choose. choose. Tafsir. Tafsir. Tafsir ibn al-Kathir. A person takes Tafsir ibn al-Kathir. And when they take Tafsir ibn al-Kathir, they make Tafsir ibn al-Kathir their reference point. So every Tafsir that they take, they bring their Tafsir ibn al-Kathir, they write on the side. You put the benefits all on Tafsir ibn al-Kathir, and you make that your marja. So wherever you go, you've got Tafsir al Kathir with you as a reference point. Then this is something amazing. Well, in that some of the ulama, like Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Baz and others, they were close to memorizing Tafsir al Kathir the way that they used to read it. Shaykh Abdul Baz, rahimahullah, مثلا, he had istihdar of the kitab, Tafsir al Kathir. He used to sometimes read it word for word, paragraphs, sentences, words. He would just bring out the kalam of Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, as it was. The reason is because he would use this as his marja, Ibn Kathir. But it was said that, it was said that uh, Abd Aziz ibn Baz, if he traveled from the books that he would take with him and the people would read on him excessively, was Bulu al-Maram and Tafsir al-Kathir. That's what they said to him. 
Those are the two th books that Ibn Baz would be taken with him and the person who is in with him, with him on the vehicle would always be reading on him. Bulug al marab and Tafsir al-Kathir. Bulug al marab because it helps the Mujtahi to do Ijtihadat based on Hadith. And if you look at Shaykh Ibn Baz rahimahullah ta'ala, he even says when he does his fatawa, if you listen to it, Rawahu al arbaa the four narrated it. Who is this istilah by who? Ibn Hajar in Bulug al marab the four narrated it, this is a term coined by Ibn Hajar in Bulugh al marab Even when he weakens a hadith, Ibn Baz uses the weaken, weakening of Ibn Hajar on Bulugh al marab And also, if you look at sometimes the fatwa of Ibn Baz and his kalam, if you go back to the tafsir Ibn Kathir, when he gives the tafsir of the ayah, you realize he's, he's reading a sentence from Ibn Kathir's tafsir. So it's very powerful if you take that book. Tafsir Ibn Kathir, some people they say it's a summary of Ibn Jarir's tafsir. Like it's not. It's actually more than that. He brings his own ijtihadat in there as well. It's more than just a summary of Tafsir ibn Jarir al-Tabari. Other scholars they choose to take the Tafsir of who? Al Imam al baghawi rahimahullah. And Al Imam al baghawis Tafsir is a summary of Ta'alabi's Tafsir. He actually took out all the, all the mistakes and all of the corrupted aqidah out of it. And Baghawi rahimahullah ta'ala summarized. He called, he called, he called it Ma'alim al Tanzil. Baghawi's Tafsir is also a book that can be a what? A marja if you want to. Some take Bagawi's tafsir and some take tafsir al kathir. Like in the most common is one, is tafsir al kathir. Now we go to the language, the Arabic language. The person studies Ajrumiyyah, then after they finish Ajrumiyyah, they go for Mutamimatul Ajrumiyyah, and they done that, then they go for Qatrul Nada, wa Ballu Sada, Ibn Hisham al Ansari. Then the person does Lamiyatul Af'al, then the person goes for Al Fiyat ibn Malik, and when the person finishes Al Fiyat ibn Malik, then they go for Mughni al Labib. After all of that, the person can't be reading all of those books regularly from beginning to end, from beginning to end. They can't do that. So what do they do? They have one book, again, as a reference point. What book is it in language? It will be the Sharh of Ibn Aqil on al fiyat ibn Malik. The al fiyat ibn Malik, by the way, is called Al-Khulasa. That's the name that the author gave it, Khulasa. It's a summary. See, that's the name of the book. It's a Khulasa. We just call it al fiyat ibn Malik because it's a thousand lines. It's a thousand lines. And it is what? It's a thousand lines and it's written by Ibn Malik rahimahullah. This book, Ikhwani, it's profound and it's great and it's a past. Generally speaking, all of the books that came before it. Even he himself says it. فَائِقَةً أَلْفِيَّةَ بْنَ مُعْطِي وَهُوَ بِسَبْقِ الْحَائِزٌ تَفْضِيلًا مُسْتَوْجِبٌ ثَنَائِيَ الْجَمِيلًا So he's Alfiya, Alfiya Ibn Malik is a khulasa, it's a summary. Summary in what? In grammar. If you take the matan, the sharah that was placed on it by Ibn Aqil, and you make that your reference point in, point in the language, that's very good. Sharah Ibn Aqil is the book you, with the tahqiq and the hashiyah and the point and the commentary of Muhammad Muhyiddin Abdul Hamid. That's very good. We go now to Mustalah al Hadith. We go to Mustalah al Hadith, Science of Hadith. Science of Hadith, there are many books. Take with you two books. You can't separate them from each other. These are your marji' in Mustalah al-Hadith. This is your reference point. Ref reference point. This is the kitab, which is the comprehensive book that you go back to. The two books. The first one is Fatul al Mughith, which is the Sharh of. It's the Sharh of Al Tabsirat wa Tadkira by Zainuddin al Iraqi, which is known as which is known as Al Fiyat al Iraqi. The kitab Al Fiyat al Iraqi. He, Iraqi is who? Iraqi is the teacher of who? Ibn Hajar rahimahullah. And who is the one who authored the sharah of the book of al fiyat al-Iraqi, Zainuddin al-Iraqi, is the student of Ibn Hajar. Ibn, Ibn Hajar's student placed an explanation on his teacher's teacher, Shamsuddin al-Sakhawi rahimahullah. So you get that book, Fatul al -Mughith. You die, You buy that book, this book is a summary. This book teaches you what, brothers like it? It teaches you the theoretical side of science of hadith, takhrij. Sorry, it teaches you why is, what does it mean when the scholars they say it's munqati', when they say it's mu'dal, when they say it's mustakhraj, when they say ala shart al-Bukhari, ala shart hima. What do they mean by this? These terms, what do they actually mean? That's why it's called mustalah. Mustalah means what? Terms that were coined by the scholars of hadith. What do they mean by it? Sah? Once the person finished studying that book, Fatul Mughith, 
they would need a f application. Application is vital. It's not enough that you just know it theoretically. So what do you go towards, brothers? You go through to Sharh al tirmidhi by Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali. Sharh al tirmidhi by Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali Ibn Rajab al is a kitab that will give you the ability to all that theory that you learned to be able to apply it. This will be a marja for you, it will be a reference point for you to how to apply what you theoretically learned. Now we go to the Shuruh al Hadith, the books that explain books of Hadith. Okay? Shuruh al Hadith. Books that are commentaries on books of Hadith. I, I can't read all of the Shuruh out there. I can't. They're too much. They're large in number. So is there one or two books that I can stick to that if I understood those books, I would be able to understand the other books? Naam. The person should give importance to the kitab uh, written by Imam al-Sanani or Subul al-Salam. Fatalib al-Ilm at the beginning level gives importance to Subul al-Salam by Amir al-Sanani or Rahimahullah. He does an i'tikaf on that book. He stands over that book. He exerts effort in it. That's a good. If the person has more aspiration, he, he, that, this is the one that small book, he wants to really go in, he wants a big sharah that he can hold on to, that he can use for that this is the book he can hold on to forever. Uh, he won't live forever like in, but uh, as long as he lives, a book that he can hold on to, that I definitely would say it has to be Fatul Bari by Ibn Hajar, Ibn Hajar al Asqalani. This kitab is gold. Okay, Fatul Bari. With it, Sharh Sahih Muslim. If you have the sharah of those two books, Bukhari sharah of Imam Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, and you have the sharah of Nawawi on Muslim, those two sharah, sharah gives you the explanation of the two most authentic books. Okay? What do you do? As I said before, that doesn't mean that you don't look at Ulul Ma'bud, that you don't look at Tuhfatul Ahwadi, you don't look at the other shuruhat on the other Qutub al-Sitta, the other four remaining books. Now what you've done is you've placed all of the other books that you studied, the shuruh and explanation that are on it, you've taken and you've placed it on your Fatul Bari. So on the top of your Fatul Bari, in the pages, little books that you've made for it, all of it is on the Fatul Bari for you. You bring all of the benefits of books on this. This is what it is for a student of knowledge. Brothers, wallahi, if you do that, this point especially, ikhtiyaru kitabin jami'in, Choosing a very comprehensive book في كل فنين, All of the subjects Which is a reference point for you You're going to be what? You're going to be a very strong, strong student of knowledge And every time you're ready You're ready Whatever it may be As you know brothers, books are coming out Sometimes Muslims are seeing books that they thought was from the lost books We, we basically thought this book was mafkud we don't have it anymore, so we've lost it. These books, when the Tatar came into the Muslim country, it got destroyed. Some Muslim scholars believe that. And then pop, the book is found. Uh, some of its pages are found. Because subhanAllah, it's actually the book. When it gets found, it gets published. Once it gets published, explanation is put on it. Once an explanation is put on it, you're going to say, I've never studied this book. Are we together? You wouldn't need to say that because you've already got a marja in that particular field. So you can go, because remember, the knowledge is very limited. Very what? It's limited. There is sometimes deeper, but you've got a good base. Maybe you might have to see a new book and then add, make your money. Look, the reference point that you have is not like it's going to stay like that forever. It's also going to grow. Every time you're adding extra things into it, it's becoming bigger and bigger. And this is very good for a student of knowledge. It saves your reading. It saves you reading. And it also allows you to always remember, as a person, what you've learned. It allows you to remember it quickly. Instead of saying, well, I have studied all of that, but I don't remember it. I studied from Ajrubiyah to Al-Fiyah to Malik, I don't know now. Where's your parents? I don't know. Teach us, I don't know. It would benefit you not to say that. And you'd be very strong in that particular. I left one book in one field, which is the Kitab. Uh, the, I didn't mention all of the subjects, by the way. I, I, I never mentioned Qawaid al fiqhia I didn't mention uh, other subjects like that. I didn't mention it. But Qawaid al fiqhia if a person, student of knowledge, he takes the Qawaid by Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, the Qawaid written by who? 
Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, or he takes the Qawaid written by Al Alai al Kaykildi, especially if you're Shafi'i, you go towards Al Alai al Kaykildi. If you're a Hanbali generally, you go for the Qawaid written by Ibn Rajab al Hanbali. If you make those marja', if you make that your reference point, that's amazing in Qawaid al Fiqhiyah. Now we're going to move, inshallah ta'ala, to the fifth thing that will allow you to be solid and strong in seeking knowledge. That is, brothers, al hirsu al mudakarah Strive to revise them. With who? Ma'al aqran With your colleagues and your friends, students. Aqran are contemporaries. Try to revise with the students, your brother who's in class with you, or somebody who's studying with you. Wal ashabi wa munaqashati al-masail. And discussing issues. Wal munafasati fi hifdi al-dala'il. And also competing with one another. What do you do? You compete with one another in memorization. It's very important. Ikhwan Mudakara, the Salaf, they used to give it a lot of importance. Let's look at some of the kalam of the ulama, rahimahumullah. And Imam al-Darimi, rahimahullah, in his sunan, in his sunan, he, he's got a sunan. Darimi has wrote a kitab, a sunan kitab. In that book, he placed inside it a chapter where he called it Babu Mudakara al-Ilm. The chapter of revising knowledge. He saw it very important. So he called it Babu Mudakara al-Ilm. And under there, he mentioned athar from the Salaf, statements of the Salaf, and quotes from the Salaf, how important it is to revise. Let's mention some of them. Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who you know, a great noble companion, he said, Tadakaru, revise. Fa'inna al-haditha, for verily hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is revived through revision. Go and revise. What gives life to and brings back hadith is revision. Somebody forgets. Another person reminds you. Allahu Akbar. And they remember it. Also, Yudus al-Rahimahullah. He said, Kunna na'ti al-Hasan. He said, we would come to Hasan al-Basri, Rahimahullah. فَإِذَا خَرَجْنَا مِنْ عِنْدِهِ When we would leave him, when he would come to him, we would take hadiths from him, and when we stood up to leave him, we wouldn't just go home. We wouldn't just go home. Hey, what would we do? تَذَكَرْنَا بَيْنَنَا We would sit down and revise amongst ourselves. What did you understand? Okay, what did he say? Mm. What did you remember him saying? We revise. Everybody would write what the other person said. Sometimes there are things that you didn't understand. Another person in the class understood it better than you do. If you go to that person, he may be able to even explain it to you better sometimes than the teacher himself. So you sit with your friends and your, the person, people that you're studying with. Muhammad ibn Fudaylin, an abihi, rahimahullah, he said, كان الحارث ibn Yazid, حارث ibn Yazid, an ibn Shubrumah, an ibn Qaqa'a, uh, sorry, an Qaqa'a ibn Yazid, an Mughira, all of them, إذا صلوا, if they prayed al Isha, if they prayed Isha, jalasu fil fiqh, they would sit together in fiqh, فَلَمْ يُفَرِّقْ بَيْنَهُمْ Nothing would divide in them إِلَّا أَذَانُ الصُّبْحِ Except the subah. Fajr adan. They would sit after Isha and revise. فِيمَا بَيْنَهُمْ Amongst them. These are the great A'imma Al-Harith ibn Yazid Al-Qaqa'an Al-Mughira ibn Yazid and others. Yazid ibn Yazid ibn Mughira. This is powerful. So student of knowledge should do that. And Imam Muhammad ibn Shahab al-Zuri from Sigar al-Tabi'ira, he said, Aafatul ilm bin nisyan. One of the harms that knowledge is afflicted with is al nisyan To forget. To be a forgetful person. Wa tarkil mudakarah. And to leave off what? And to leave off revision. And to leave off what? Leave, leave off religion. It's one of the things that harms knowledge. It takes away from you. All that which you learned and all that which you studied, is it going to benefit you if you forgot it? You're, you and the one who's never studied are both the same. And leaving off revision. Revision is what brings back the memory. Also, Sa'id, Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz was, <coughs> he was scolding and he was shouting at the students of Abu, uh, Imam al-Awza'iyu. And Imam al-Awza'iyu, Imam al sham he was scolding and shouting at the students of Imam al-Awza'iyu. He said to them, Malakum la 
Why is it that you don't come together? Why is it that you, you don't revise together? It's telling them off. He then, the ulama or salaf, the pious predecessors, they made it part of their life to revise. So revision brothers helps. That you sit with the tulab, the brothers, you sit with them, you discuss with them, you debate topics together. Because remember you're all together. So you debate it fima baynakum. And you sometimes come out with good questions. Once you've revised something and you've debated and you've discussed this issue very well, a question pops up. None of you guys can answer it. Write it down. Let's ask the teacher, inshallah ta'ala. Let's what? Let's ask the teacher. Write it up for us. That's a good question. Allah barik. We didn't look at it. Yeah? You bring the question, you get an answer for it. So your yeah, knowledge increases in that regard. It's very important. Muraja, brothers, it strengthens not only the understanding, but also the memory as well. The memorization, it also what? It also, it also opens it. The sixth thing that will help brothers is Al-Inayatu bil qiraatil munadzamah. Brothers, give importance to reading, but in an organized manner. You have a methodology in the way you read. This is the sixth thing that will help you. Having a methodological approach in reading. You follow a manhaj, which is sahiha, a correct methodology. Fikhtiyar al-kutub in how you choose the books. Wa fawaidiha. And you have a methodology of how you extract benefits from books. You have a methodology. You also have a methodology in which you follow when you write the content pages for books and when you summarize books. It's a methodology you follow. You don't just jump on a book and just do it. It's a methodology that you have that you follow. This is prescribed by a teacher. The person asks the teacher. The bro brothers, the topic of reading, inshallah ta'ala, I think we should make it one time by itself. The book and a student, the relationship between the two of them. But now we will just mention that the reading is two types. A qira'a, a type of reading where the student of knowledge is trying to deeply understand this book. He is reading it bitani wa tarawi. He's trying to read it calmly, collectively, observe it. He's taking his time. He might spend on this book weeks, months. He might be on this book. The purpose is that he wants to understand it word for word. The second type of reading is called al qiraa al sariah a fast type of reading. Where the person is going over the book very fast. This now is a different discussion. But the person does that. They go over a book quickly. They look at it. Just This book is mujarrat al tila It's just mere reading it and taking in information. And the student needs to have that as well. There are some books you read fast and you do ittila of it very, very fast. But there also has to be books that you read with the purpose and the aim of what? Of taking in this information. How, you want to take benefit from this book. You always, brothers, have to have a little book where you read it, you're reading a book. Some fa'idah comes, a benefit comes, you write it. The way that I think students should look at benefits is as follows. When you're reading a book and you come across a benefit, take that particular benefit that you came across. And what you do, brothers, you have a book in your house where you write benefits in. You've made headings for every point. As you're reading, you're going to come across something, you're going to be like, subhanAllah, this is a fa'idah. Take it and put it under the benefit, the chapter that you made that benefit for a, long, a couple of years ago. Does that make sense? Let's, let's say you're talking about ikhlas, the benefits of ikhlas. So you're reading, 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 you come across a statement of a sahabi, or you come across a statement of a tabi'i or something on the issue of sincerity, which you never heard of before. You run, you go to your book, you add onto it this statement. You come across a what do you call it, a fa'idah, in the same book that you're reading, the next page you come across a benefit pertaining to what? A benefiting pertaining to, let's say, uh, stay, 
you know, not seeing this world as the ultimate goal and not having your heart connected to it. You take it, and what do you do, brothers? You've got a book where you've, he you've made headings for it. Everything just goes under it, like that. Sometimes, brothers, that book can be for you, muhadarat, khutabs, turus. It can be everything for you. If you do choose to die, it can be made into fawaid. Benefits. People just take it. SubhanAllah, all quotes, statements of the Salaf, ahadith, ayat. Are we together, brothers? So you have that. It's at home. It's fawaid. It's book for benefits that you write in it. You give it a name. You go back to it. You keep putting things in there. You go back to your reading. You what? You, call, you go back to your reading and etc. The person should have that methodology. So what do, we feel, what do we take from that, brothers? That when you're reading, you need to have a pen. Reading just like this, with no pen, is not right. There has to be a pen next to it and a paper when you're writing, when you're reading a book. Where you're always just going to write a benefit quickly, this point. Should the pen be different colors? I definitely believe it should be. Personally, I, wouldn't, I don't like one color. I like different colors. So you mention, you make different colors for different things. This is your choice. Whatever color you want to choose for what, how you want to do color. That's, see, you have to have a methodology though that you follow when it comes to writing benefits. Number seven. Number seven is al-hirsu ala furu'i ila usuliha. You give importance, brothers, in bringing matters which are disputed, you bring it back to its foundation. Scholars differ on issues. You don't just look at the difference of opinion, you look at why they differed. It's very important. You try to go back to the fundamental reason of why the difference occurred. I'll give you an example. Allah says in the Quran, فَبْعَثُ حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا Allah tells us in the Quran that when a man and a wife dispute one another, okay? If the husband and the wife, they dispute one another, is, is the hakam, the arbitrary that's between the wife and the husband, is his rulings, because he listens to what the wife, Allah says, first of all, if the two wife and the husband dispute one another, Allah says, فَبْعَثُ حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا So what do we place? We place a judge from the women's side and from the man's side. They are now going to come to a conclusion. Both of them are going to meet. Are we together? They are both what? They are both going to discuss this issue. From the husband and the, there's a representative. They are going to listen to, they're going to talk to each other. The matter is now being uplifted from the two spouses because they couldn't get to terms with each other. Now the question here is, now you woke up Abu Bakr. Hakaman min ahlihi wa hakaman min ahliha. Pay attention to this. When the two hakam come together, the fuqaha differed. Is the statement that comes from both of them, the judgment that they pass, is it mulzam? Is it obligatory for the spouse to follow it? Does that make sense? Is it obligatory? Does it have to be followed or does it not have to be followed? Are they just suggesting, uh, suggesting something or is their judgment now becomes obligatory? It has to be followed. There's no way out of it. Fuqaha differed. Difference of opinion. Now, you might say, mm, why were they there for the first? This is what you would say probably. Okay, when you look at the issue, you'd say, if they were brought, then the, it should be followed, right? That's what you'd say. But you don't understand the asal of the khilaf. You don't understand the reason why they are differing on this issue. You're just looking at a far'i issue. You're just looking at the, the dispute and how it, uh, what it is. But you don't know where it's coming from. The dispute really comes back from, this is the mansha' al-khilaf. This is the foundation of dispute. Which is what? Is the arbitrary that are speaking on behalf of the spouse, are they hakims? As in like, are they both hakims? And they are being given this job by a hakim, a qadi or something. Or they are they wakil, are they representatives only? That they're just representing someone, but they don't have the final say. Which of those are they? Because the difference between the mufti and the qadi, does you guys know the difference between the mufti and the qadi? Huh? 
What is the difference between a mufti and a qadi? It's more than that. The qadi has to be followed. If the qadi says something, it's obligatory. It has to be done. The mufti, like the one who's given fatwa, he's just mentioning the opinion. You might look at him and say, I don't agree with him, and you can go. Also, the difference between the two of them is that the qadi has to listen to both sides. The mufti doesn't have to listen to both sides. The mufti can be asked a question and just answer the way it is. The way it is. Whereas the qadi, because he's given a judgment now, what does he say? I have to hear both sides. I can't just give judgment based on one side. Where's the other person? Why are they not here? Because his kalam is, has ilzam on it. Does that make sense? So the person who is the arbitrary between the husband and the wife, are they speaking on behalf of the qadi? Meaning the qadi is giving them the authority and said to them, look, you, you say what I would, you speak on my behalf, that's it. Or are they just representing him, but he's got the final say, the qadi and the hakim has the final say. Does that make sense? This is the mansha ul khilaf. Okay? So you have to learn this, that when a dispute occurs, what is the actual khilaf? For example, ru'yatul hilal. You're going to, Ramadan is coming now. That's a, that's a more practical example. Ramadan is going to come now. When Ramadan comes, the dispute is going to be about the sighting of the moon. Okay? The sighting of the moon. The question the fuqaha differ upon is a dispute amongst the fuqaha. That if a person sees the hilal, a person goes and he sees the crescent, he sees the hilal alone, does he fast or does he not fast? He saw it. Does he fast or does he not fast? From the scholars are those who said that if he sees the crescent, if he sights the moon, he has to fast even if the other people haven't fasted. Another group of scholars, they say, La. No. Hey, he can't fast unless the people fast. He has to fast with the people. Now, the, this is a khilaf, right? It's a khilafi issue. The question you need to ask yourself is, what's the bencha ul khilaf? This is a far' issue. Bring it back to its asal. Bring it to its foundation. What is the fundamental reason why the dispute has occurred? Are we together, brothers? What's the dispute? The dispute is actually what is meant by a hilal. Are we together, brothers? Some of the ulama, they say, the hilal is something that everyone has to see. That's what hilal means. Are we together? To them, hilal means mashtahara, that which is common and famous and everyone can see. If it's not seen by everyone, it's not a hilal. Does that make sense? And another one believes that the hilal is not necessarily what everyone sees. So the mansha ul khilaf is based upon what's a hilal and what's not. Are we all together, brothers? And etc. So we have to try to bring every masail which are disputed as a talib ilm. What's the mansha ul khilaf? What's the fundamental reason of it? This will help you a lot. You know why it will help you a lot? Because as a student of knowledge, you don't have a lot of time to waste your time on furu' some branches. You always want to know the foundation. Because to know the fundamentals and the foundation is greater for you than anything else. Point number eight, that will help you become grounded in attaining knowledge. And that is, it is تَجَنُّبُ الْإِغْرَابِ وَالتَّبَنِّ الْأَقْوَالِ الشَّادَّةِ وَالْغَرِيبَةِ الْخَارِجَةِ عَنِ الْمُشْتَهَرِ مِنَ الْفَتْوَىٰ It is to stay away from. It is to avoid building, I'm using, I'm coming with strange opinions. Opinions that are gharib. Aqwal which are shad, fringe statements. <coughs> Stay away from them. Those types of fatwas and views which are what? Al kharijati bin al mushtaha. That's outside the realm of what? That which is famous, that's common. At this particular time that we live, there are some people who are known only to do what? To tabu aqwal shadda. All they do is follow aqwal shadda. All they bring together is statements which are strange, shad, fringe statements. They keep bringing that to you. Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi who said, لا يقول إماما A person is not an imam. في العلم in knowledge من أخذ بالشاد من العلم The one who takes strange opinions. The one who takes strange opinions. And he makes it his 
religion and he bases his what? His belief upon. That person is never an Imam. You know why? Because let's say this state's strange opinion came from Imam Ahmed or Imam Shafi'i or Imam Malik or Imam Abu Harifa. When it came from them, the overwhelming majority of the times they're in line with the ulama. But this one particular situation or these couple of times they came with Akhwal which are Shahada. What you did was though, you made your religion majority of it based on Akhwal al Shahada. Whose madhab is that then? Does that make sense? Whose madhab is to have Akhwal al Shahada? Huh? Akhwal al Shahada, strange opinions, to make it your whole madhab. And say, what did Ozai say in this issue? Ah, I like that. Subhanallah, it's good. Ozai said that, yeah, strange opinion. Give it to me. Uh, and take all of those aqwal which are shad and gharib. Anyone who does that, ya ikhwa, the salaf they used to say, anyone who takes strange opinions like that, who takes aqwal which are incorrect like that, just gathers them to, together, you'll find that this person, tazandaqa, he'll become a heretic, a ziddiq. Because what you're bringing together, when it's taken as a religion, it becomes kufr sometimes. Sometimes it becomes what? Kufur. Disbelief. It can reach. And a lot of them, they do that today. And they open doubts on the tulab and the students of knowledge when it comes to these issues. Say, look, the view I hold, Qadr Iyad holds it. And Nawawi holds it. Sah. You have to remember as a student of knowledge, do we believe that the scholars are ma'asumeen? Ismatul ulama. Do we believe that? Huh? Do we believe Ismatul ulama? Do we believe the scholars are infallible? They don't believe they're infallible. They can do mistakes. So brothers, when you're seeking knowledge, one of the things that shaitan will grab you on is to always want to be alone. It will try to do that to you. Just to be unique. Allah, man, I'm different. Students, we love that. Huh? That's what happens to you. Fear Allah ta'ala and stay in line with that which is the aqwal that the ulama the jumhur are upon. The person should stay away from the common fatwa, stay away from it when you're a student of knowledge. And stop becoming a person who is conceited and full of himself. The reason why a person would not do that, and he would take aqwal which are gharib, and he would take aqwal which are shadda, is for two reasons. The person is conceited, he's full of himself. That's wallah, you're going to see this, brothers. The people who take aqwal which are shadda and gharibah, they are conceit, they're full of, them, from, of themselves. They feel high of them. I'm alam, I'm mufti, that's what I am. He thinks high of himself. jahl or ignorance. He's actually genuinely ignorant. That's what's happened to him. He's what? He's ignorant. The ninth thing, ya ikhwa, that helps you to be precise in knowledge is al hadar min al fil al wal qira'ati ala hisab al dabt wal itqal. Stay away from it. Um, stay away from what brothers reading too much where you get rid of precision and study and learning sometimes what happens is somebody does and qira'ah. they start to read and read and go through books after books in reading and that then gets rid of the, preci the program that he was meant to do what happened to you? I thought you studied Nukhbat al Fikr. So, what is he looking at? He had a program he was following. The program that we were talking about before, which he was becoming a, a person who's mutqin, a person who has loved accuracy and precision in knowledge. A problem occurred here. He started to buy books, he started to gather those books, and he's now at home just reading. He knows Arabic now, so he's just a reader. He reads now. What does he do? He reads. This is now taking place of your itqan and dabd. Don't let that happen to you. Yes, read. But let the program and your study take first priority now. That's more important. Don't let it get in your way. Walidhalik ibn al-Jama'ah says, Rahimahullahu ta'ala in his kitab, Tadkiratu Sami' wal Mutakallim, Fi Adab al-Alim wal Mutaallim. He says, وَكَذَلِكَ يَحْذَرُ فِي ابْتِدَاءِ الْطَلَبِهِ That the student of knowledge stays away from the beginning of his seeking knowledge. Al-Mutala'ati fi tafariq al-Musannafat. He stays away from reading individual scattered books. He stays away from that. Ah. Because this, what does it do? It destroys and it makes you lose your time when you start reading these books too much. And what it, what it does is that it scatters your brain. It does that to you. 
بل يعطي الكتاب الذي قرأه أو الفرد الذي يأخذه كليته حتى يتقنه Rather what the person should do is He should put all of his mind to He said رحمه الله He should put all of his mind to what? The book that he studied with the Shaykh And put all his effort in it If he's got time, extra time Just read with the book the teacher is teaching him Why is the case? Why is that the case? The reason is because When the teacher is teaching you Okay And the teacher is going through a subject with you Okay, if you go and you read some other books, those and you haven't grounded yourself, you won't know whether that book is right or wrong. Okay, you won't know it. You will also f take from that book thinking that you know what you, you, you're talking about, when in reality, you haven't. So you've got ma'lumat now, you start to gather information instead of what? Accuracy and dubbed, and you become grounded. But when you read everything after you've grounded yourself, the lens that you're reading it in is putting it in. You're like, this is wrong. This is strange. Subhanallah. It's opposing this principle and this. See, you're grounded. You accept it and you reject things. Your reading is correct, is strong. Because remember what we're talking about here is dubbed and itqan. You want to be precise in knowledge. Shaykh Allah Abdul Kim used to say that a person who just reads a lot and forsakes these programs becomes a journalist, a suhufi, a mufakir, a thinker, that's it, خلاص. that's the most you're going to be. You're going to be a student of knowledge, you're not going to be a scholar. If you're just an Islamic thinker. You're a what? You're a journalist who's got information and etc. So what you do is stay away from reading too much that gets rid of الضبط والإتقان. The tenth is العناية بكتب العلماء المحققين. Given importance to brothers, not every single book. When you go to a library and you want to buy a book, stay away from what? Give importance to books that are written by scholars of tahqiq. What does it mean, a scholar of tahqiq? It's a scholar who's elite. A scholar who looked at all of the views in this issue and has reached a final conclusion. You, you buy those scholars' works. Al-inayat al-kutul ulama al-muhaqqiqeen. Why? Because Books of those scholars, it shortens the path for you. It does. And with them, you will gain a lot of knowledge. And it will also suffice you from even reading a lot. You wouldn't have to read a lot if you read their works. They will give you the gems. They will give you the general overall reality that you need. And without a doubt, the first that come to mind in this regard is none other than Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and his student in Nuqayyim al jawziyah These are from the ulama al-muhaqqin. وَلِذَلِكَ Anybody who does not read the works of Ibn Taymiyyah and he doesn't read the kalam of Ibn Al-Qayyim from the mutaakhirin, from the late scholars who have come after the Salaf al-Salih anyone who hasn't read the works of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al-Qayyim bid'a will creep into him without a shadow of a doubt. It will creep into him without a shadow of a doubt. That's the reality. You have to do, you have to have ilmam of the works of Ibn Taymiyyah. You have to have reading of the works of... Al Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he wrote a kitab called Minhaj as sunnah al Nabawi, right? The real name for that book, by the way, is actually, and what the author called it in more than one place, is called Minhaj al sunnah That's what the book is actually meant to be. It's very commonly known as Minhaj al sunnah al Nabawi. Ibn Taymiyyah wrote this book in refutation by of who? A Shi'i individual. What was his name? Ibn Tahir al Muhilli. Ibn Taymiyyah wrote a refutation on him. When Ibn Taymiyyah refuted him, Ibn Tahir al Muhilli, when Shaykh al Islam got out to refute him and to respond to him and criticize him, before that the Shi'a never used to give no importance to hadith and the science of hadith. Are we all together, brothers? They gave, till today, subhanAllah, they still lack giving reporters to hadith and its sciences. Are we all together? The most authentic book to them is called Kitab called Al Kafi, written by Al Kulayni. Kulayni wrote that Kitab. The author is Machul, no one knows him, where he studied, where he took knowledge from. His biography is unknown. If the author is Machul, <laughs> How are we going to look at the narrators and what they said and who... 
This is the Bukhari of the Shia, by the way. Bukhari of the Shia. The author of the Kitab al-Kafi is not, not known. Wallahi la ya'rifuna. They don't know where he sought knowledge. They don't know who he took from. They're nothing about him. And the Talaqudat in just that book alone, just a contradiction in that book alone, is more than a thousand. What they affirm here, what they affirm here. The biggest of them, the biggest of it is that they believe that every single person is a murtad, except three people. Ali ibn Abi Talib is not in there. The Ummah, the hadith says for them, irtaddat al-Arab, Arab apostated after the Prophet, except three. Ali is not in the three. Are we together? So some of them will come up to you and say to you, no, what we mean by this is other than the Ahlul Bayt Rasulullah. Another narration in the Kitab Al-Kafi rejects that. What is it? That Ali ibn Abi Talib is mentioned in it. They mentioned seven this time. Ali is in the Fatim is not in there. So you can't say Ahlul Bayt now because Ali put it in it. So what about Fatim? What about Hassan? What about Hussein? Are they Murtadeen as well? Sah? The Tanaqulat in these people is shocking. I asked one Rafidi a while back, I said to him, your Kitab al-Kafi, is it the most authentic book? He said, yes, it's like better than your Bukhari. I said, in the Kitab al-Kafi, to you guys, is the most authentic book? He said, yes, good. Um, and in that same book, it says, At-Taqiyyatu, Deedi wa Deed Abai. Taqiyya is my religion and the religion of my forefathers. فَمَنْ لَا تَقِيَّةَ لَهُ Anyone who has no taqiyyata فَلَا إِمَانَ لَهُ He has no iman. So taqiyya is kufr. If the person doesn't come with taqiyya in the Rafidah's eyes, is a disbeliever. Are we all together? If you don't come with taqiyya, you're a kafir to the Rafidah. Are we together, brothers? Yeah? So I said, how do you know the iman when he's doing taqiyya and when he's not? In the narrations. So how do you know when he's narrating the hadith, he's not doing taqiyya here? If taqiyya is kufr and iman for you, He's getting closer to Allah by doing taqiyya. How do you know he's not lying to us in this narration right now? Ah. They can't give you a babit for it. They can't. And then your whole book, there's a great percentage and a great belief. Because you can't say that taqiyya, you can't do it if you want. That would have been okay, accepted. But they say it's, wa, it's kufr and iman. So the imam has to do taqiyya. So it's clear that he's doing a taqiyya here. So he's lying. وَلِذَلِكَ all of the Ahlul Bid'ah, the narrations are accepted in the Hadith, except the Rafidah. We never accept their Hadith. Scholars used to reject them. They lie. عَلَى كُلْ حَالٍ The scholars of Tahqiq, you have to read their works. Shaykh Al-Sami ibn Taymiyyah, and Ibn Al-Qayyim Al-Jawziyyah. And the books of Ibn Taymiyyah that you should give a lot of importance to brothers is his Majmu' Al-Fatawa. You should give importance to his Kitab, Iqtidaw Salat Al-Mustaqeem. You should give importance to his kitab, Minhaj al-Sunnah Nabawiyah. And the, best, the correct name, as I said before, is what? Minhaj al-Sunnah is called. You should try to also buy the book, Bayanu Talbis al-Jahmiyyah, Al-Raddu al al-Bakri. These are his works that are. And many, many, many more things. Also, Ibn al-Qayyim, you, you read his works, his athar, especially his kitab, Bizal al-Bi'an, his Muqtasa Sawa'iq al-Mursala, his Ulam al-Waqi'in, his Tahdeeb al-Sunan. You try to read those works of his. And also two other Imams you should give importance to. <coughs> Ibn Rajab al-Hambali's works and half of the Hajar. You should give importance to that. Ibn Rajab al-Hambali rahimahullah, his Fatul Bari. You should give importance to his kitab Jam Ulum al-Hikam. You should give importance to the book of Imam Ibn Hajar Fatul Bari. And all of his other works, like his Nukhwat al-Fikr and his Tarkhis al-Habir and other books that he's written. Also, you should give a lot of importance to the Da'wah Aimmat al-Najdiyah. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and his offspring and their works. You buy the Kitab al durr al-Saniyah fi fi uh, al durr al-Saniyah fi ajribati a'immati da'wati najdiya. You also buy the fatawa a'immati da'wati najdiya, the fatawa that they gave. You should also read their works that they written, their little rasail, etc. Tafsir Ibn Kathir as well. His works, he's from the Muhaqqiqin rahimahullah. You read his works. Ibn Qudam is from the Muhaqqiqin. You read his works. Ibn Uthaymin is from the Muhaqqiqin. Shaykh Abd Aziz Nubay. Shaykh Abd Aziz Nubay is from the Muhaqqiqin. Shaykh Nasir al-Din al-Albani. These are scholars and ulama. You sit down and you do i'tikaf on their works. We now move on, inshaAllah ta'ala, to the 11th 
point. Also, I have to add the Sharh of Kawkab al Munir and also the Muwafaqat for the previous one. Wallahi, Ya Ikhwat al Kiram, try to stand over the Kitab al Muwafaqat by Imam al Shatibi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Number 11. If you want to be a person who's precise and has strong knowledge, brothers, give importance to what? An inayah to be fatawa al-ulama mu'asirin. You give importance to the fatwa of the contemporary scholars. You know, we have new things that keep happening. We have contemporary issues coming up. You have, you give importance to the fatawa of the ulama of this time, the things that they said. You can't just say, well, I read the kalam of the mutaqaddimin and I, I leave the mutaakhirin. No, you need to read them. You need to read the fatawa of Lajna al-Da'ima, Hayyati Kibar al-Ulama. You need to read the fatawa that are made by them. And the fatwa are two types, brothers. Okay, brothers. The fatwa are what? Two types. Fatawa which are individuals. Okay, individuals. Individual fatwas. You read them. Like Ibn Uthaymi's fatwa, Liqabah al-Mastuha, read it. Fatawa Nur al darb read it. Also, what you read, to, what you read is what? What do you read? You also read the fatawa that are made by organizations, hayat and majami' islamiya. Okay, you read them. Whether it comes from the fatwa comes from Azhar, whether it comes from Aramit Alim Islami, whether it from, comes from Hayati Kibar or Ulama, you read their fatwa, what they say. Because this is not an individual fatwa, it's a congregational fatwa. And a congregational fatwa is powerful and it reaches ijtihad of a high caliber. Back in the days, na'am, all of this. All of the Hayti Kabar ulama is equivalent to Ibn Taymiyyah. Okay? Uh, there is equivalent to Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah. But now, mashallah, when they come together, they give us the knowledge that, the elite knowledge. So their fatwa, the hayat, the legend, the fatwas that come from big, whether it be Saudi or outside Saudi as well, outside Saudi as well, wherever it may be, it's very powerful. You read those, uh, you read those works. Um, number 12. It is al istifada, brothers that you benefit from the tajarib al ulama, the experiences that the scholars have gathered. Fil kutub wa turuq tahsil al ilm. You give importance to the experiences that the scholars have gone through, and their tajarib, the experiences. Fil kutub in books and wa turuq tahsil al ilm and how they attain knowledge. Books that talk about rihalat, where the scholars they speak about. Their journeys when they seek knowledge, where the countries they went to, and scholars they met, and you read those books. It's very important. And the effort that they exerted in attaining knowledge, and etc., it will help you a lot to become precise. You will know the do's and the don'ts. Remember, time is very short. How much time can you save if somebody who's experienced tells you the right things? You can save a lot of time. You can get to the goal faster than many people. One of the things that people don't achieve anything, brothers, is because he wants to do a mistake somebody already before him did it. And you waste years of your life like that. What do you do? You waste years of your life. This person will save you five, ten years maybe of his life, of what he learned. He'll save you that time. You take it on board. Number 13 is Adam al talaqul bayna tara'iq wal manahij, which is the last one, inshaAllah ta'ala, is that you stay away from you abstain from brothers changing methodology of seeking knowledge if you have a teacher a person who's teaching you you're going through lessons with them and a methodology has been paved for you a way has been paved for you what do you do you stay away you stay upon that way what do you do you stay on that way you don't leave it a methodology has been set for you a Sheikh said to you, we're going to do this is Mustawa al-Awwal, this is Mustawa al-Thani, al-Thani, al-Rabi, al-Khamis, first level, second level, third level, fourth level, fifth level. And he wrote these books for you. And you say, Sheikh, Allah, you know what, yeah, let's add this book here because, you know, Sheikh so-and-so's books, Manhaj, this is what they do. No, no. Don't jump from one methodology to another methodology, another way from, don't. Follow the one that was set for you. And keep upon that. Because what it does to you is that sometimes you jump to this one, you jump to that one. And I said this before, it happens to students who go to Egypt, for instance. They go to a college, or they go to an institute, sorry. So they go to one particular institute. They watch what they teach. And they say, oh, subhanAllah, they're good at this, but I don't agree with this methodology. Who are you? You're a student of knowledge, a beginner. You start an institute. So he jumps, he goes to another institute. Look, he's dying. He jumps from that one. 
after a year, guess what he's done? He's gone through all of the institute. If you ask him, the only knowledge he has is about the institute. So this institute, the, the, the thing about this institute is this, yeah? Allah, this one, subhanAllah, grandma. All of it is, that's all he knows. And he cannot tell you, Wallahi, what he learned. He hasn't finished any of them. He has not finished any of them. Actually, just stick to one. Stop jumping from one to another. You, you get more by just sticking to one of them. And getting to the ending of it. Okay, your own fingers are not the same. Your own fingers are not the same. One of the things, Wallahi, I learned when I was seeking knowledge is that this is what happens. People compare teachers. Well, like, this teacher is good at this, and this teacher likes this. First of all, when you're a beginner, how do you know who's good and who isn't? You shouldn't. That's not, you don't know what's good or what's good about you know? But what you do is you start comparing teachers. But what I realized, Wallahi, later was that actually it was good that you have different teachers who have different approaches and the way that they teach. It's beneficial. One scholar, one sheikh, he gives so much importance on explaining the text. He just sticks to the text, he doesn't go outside it. We'll critique him, we say, why doesn't he bring extra information? Or this sheikh, wallah, he quotes other things. Yeah, wallah, this is, the fact that he does that is of benefit, is it not? It's of great benefit, that he sticks to the text. Another sheikh doesn't do that, he goes outside and means anything. He's good. So what you do is you should actually appreciate the variation in the sheikh. Does it, shouldn't he? Not waste time comparing them. Because if they all were the same, you wouldn't have what this was given and this was not given. Does that make sense? Variation is a benefit. The variation is a benefit. Somebody will critique, مثلا, a particular sheikh and say, no, like this sheikh, I don't like his lessons. What? He goes over the book so fast. Does that make sense? Another one says, well, I don't like this sheikh. Why? He goes too deep into these books. He's too long in them. I don't like him. So if you feel like this one is what you like, stick to it. But this one serves other people that not you like him. Does that make sense? He serves another type of audience. And the fact Allah has made all of this variation, alhamdulillah, is, is amazing. Allah didn't all make us one color. He didn't make us all one background. He didn't all make us one language. He could have, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did us all different variations. Because a person might like this person's color, and this person might like this person's this, and this person might like this person's language, and this person, variation. You may not like it. You might like your own color. You might like your own this. No problem. No problem. It's not a crime. But some, these variations is of great value. I'm going to conclude, inshallah ta'ala, with a kalam nafis by Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah. Ibn al-Qayyim said, al knowledge is six. Sit, he said it's sit to maratib. Knowledge is seven, uh, six levels. Awaluha, the first of them is husn al-su'al, asking good question. Athaniya, the second one is husn al-insati al-istima'a, being a good listener. Athanithu, the third one is, so one more time. The first one is asking a good question. Second one is being a good listener. The third one is husn al-fahmi, having good understanding. The fourth one is al hifdu memorizing. al khamisu the fifth one is Al-Ta'limu, teaching. Al-Sadisu, wa thamaratu, which is the outcome of knowledge, which is Al-Amalu bihi, is to implement it. wa muraati hududi, and it's to observe the boundaries that this knowledge has given you now. This knowledge is now implementation for you. فَمِنَ النَّاسِ From the people are those مَنْ يَحْرُمُهُ لِعَدَمِ سُؤَالِهِ Some people are prevented, he said, from asking questions that benefits him and benefits others. He doesn't have, good, he doesn't have ask, asking good questions. He asks about things that don't matter, things that have no benefit. And from the people are those who are not good listeners. He's a very argumentative person. So he doesn't have the second one. This person is prevented from knowledge, he said. Another person is a person who doesn't understand anything. He doesn't understand the knowledge that's given to him. He can't comprehend it. And the fourth one, he said that it's a people who have been prevented from memorizing what they've already learned. So as soon as it goes in, it leaves them. 
They're exerting their, it's leaving their mind. Wallahu a'lam and Allah knows best subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala rasulihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We're going to conclude there inshallah ta'ala. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and shaitan and Allah and his messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa tuhili.